Good afternoon and welcome to Live at the Museum, Australia's Olympic history. My name is Penelope Vale and I'm joined today by curator Lena Hall and Australian Olympians Tate Ramadani and Patria Thomas, who's joining us via Zoom. Before we kick off today's program, I would like to, as always, start with an acknowledgement of country. We're filming today on the lands of the Ngunnawal, Ngunnawal and Ngambri people of Canberra. I pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging, and I extend that respect to any and all First Nations people here present and joining us via the live stream. So, as I mentioned, we're here to discuss Australia's Olympic history, and I am joined by on site by uh, Australian Olympian Tate Ramadani, who represented Australia in handball from 93 to 95, including at the Sydney 2000 Olympics. Hi, Tate. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, thank you. Uh, and Patria Thomas, who has represented Australia in three Olympic Games and has won a total of eight medals um, in, the, in the Olympics across her career. Hi, Patria. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, and also Lena Hall, who was the curator here from the National Museum, who put together this fabulous Olymp Olympic history display, uh, including Betty behind us. Hi, Lena. It's lovely to have you back visiting. Thank We've you. stolen her back from another institution for half an Just hour. Just a moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you have any questions during the beautiful tour that we have recorded with Lena, please don't hesitate to ask them straight away so that we can get to them immediately after this short tour. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the National Museum of Australia. My name is Lena Hall and I'm a curator here and I'm standing with Betty. Now you might be wondering what a giant Cupid doll is doing here in the Gandell Atrium. Well, Betty is one of a number of objects currently on display, helping us celebrate 20 years since the Sydney 2000 Olympics. Australia has competed at every Olympics of the modern era and hosted the Games twice, in Melbourne in 1956 and again in Sydney in 2000. On both occasions, Australian athletes performed amazingly on home soil. But the Games also provided Australia an opportunity to showcase its culture to an international audience. Venues for the 300 Olympic events were packed. A group of almost 50,000 brightly dressed volunteers helped to ensure that everything ran smoothly. And an audience of 3.7 billion people across 220 countries tuned in for the broadcast to share in these amazing sporting moments. As the Olympics drew to a close, a group of museum professionals were working to collect some of the Olympics for posterity. That collection is now distributed across cultural institutions nationally, including here at the National Museum of Australia. Some of the objects that we have include audience kits and costumes from the opening and closing ceremonies, as well as mascots, Sid, Ollie and Millie, and one of my favourites, the giant Cupid doll. Over the years, the museum has also sought to collect additional objects that speak to the Sydney 2000 Olympics, including this amazing painting by Eunice Yunarupa Porter and Jean Inyalanka Burke. What it shows is a representation of a group of Indigenous women from Warakuna in the Western Desert who took part in the opening ceremony. It's a fantastic capturing of a really important moment linking Sydney 2000 with a remote Indigenous community. Another few objects that we have that really speak to the experience of the Olympics are things like Nova Paris's opening ceremony uniform and also the uniform that she wore as the first torchbearer for the official Olympic torch relay. In addition to objects from the Sydney 2000 Olympics, the museum also has a number of fantastic objects that relate to the Melbourne 1956 Olympics, including this wonderful ABC outside broadcast van. Now, television had only recently arrived in Australia, just in time for the 56 Olympics. On arrival in Australia, the ABC outside broadcast van was part of screening the first live television broadcasts. After that, they drove from Sydney down to Melbourne and the Olympics was essentially this van's first big gig. 
The display is not only an opportunity to reminisce about Sydney 2000, though I'm sure many of you have some very fond memories, but it's also an opportunity to consider Australia's proud Olympic tradition and reflect on the way that sport inspires and connects us across Australia and around the world. Thank you for taking us through some of our Olympic history collection, Lena. It's really interesting to see some of the things that we collect. Uh, before we jump off into audience questions, I'd love to open with a question for all of our uh, panellists today. And I might start with Tate. I'll move on to Patria, I think. Um, do you remember when you first became aware of the Olympics? So Tate, do you mind kicking us off today? Yes. It was a few months before the LA Games in 1984. At the time, I'd been living in Kosovo, which was then part of the former Yugoslavia, and in a small village. And news was starting to trickle in about a young 18-year-old freestyle wrestler from a neighboring village who'd made the Olympic team of Yugoslavia. And we were all excited about that. And in the excitement, my parents went out and bought the first color TV in the village. And when the Games actually started, with every bout, uh, the crowds in our house grew, grew more each time. And he went on to make the final and win the Olympic uh, gold medal and uh, inspired a lot of people to take up wrestling, including me, for, for a very short time. <laughs> That's a fantastic story of community as well. Uh, Patria, what about you? Do you remember when you first became aware of the Olympics? Uh, likewise, I think for me, it was the 1984 LA Olympics where I uh, first, I was nine at the time and um, became aware of, um, you know, the, the feats of our Australian athletes on the TV. And I remember having a photo taken. Uh, my mum had obviously bought me a little pair of um, uh, 1994 LA Olympic um, bathers to wear. And I, I still remember the photo that I had in those bathers. And, and that for me was probably the what lit the flame. And Lena, what about you? When did you first become aware of the Olympics? I think in answer to this question, we're all showing our age because it was also the 1984 Olympics. And again, TV playing a crucial role in that. I was actually um, living in Germany at the time as a kid. And I remember being really conflicted about sort of you know, getting excited about the achievements of the German athletes at that stage, but then also, you know, with my Australian connection and like, really feeling a, a pull towards supporting the Australian athletes as well. And so for me, that was a, a really interesting moment and, you know, just so vivid still. I I could be really wicked and say that my very first Olympic memory is 1996, so, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, but I won't. <laughs> so, um, Patria, I'm going to throw this one to you first. How did it feel uh, going out into the Olympic arena to represent Australia for the first time? Yeah, it was amazing. Uh, my first Olympics was the 96 Olympics in Atlanta. And um, it was just so exciting um, coming into an environment where the, you know, you're in a team with the best athletes in Australia um, initially, and then you, you get into a village environment and you start walking around and, and seeing some world famous athletes as well. And, and then of course the competition, I mean, that's what we train for as athletes to represent our, our country at the highest level. And for my sport of swimming, that is uh, at the Olympic games. And it was, it was just so exciting and it was all, all my dreams come true at once, really. And uh, Tate, what was it like for you stepping out onto the arena? Uh, were you, you're versing Sweden, I think, is that right? That's right. Sweden were the world champions. And I remember the moment vividly. We lined up for the national anthems. And in that moment, while the anthem is playing, you have a moment of reflection and, you know, you, you have flashbacks of the hard work you put into it. The, the sacrifice your family and wife had gone through to support you through this process. And you, I, I became overwhelmed and uh, overcome with emotion and, and pride for what I'd achieved and the fact that I'd finally made it to something that I dreamed for a long time. That's quite 
astounding. Uh, it's not a, a feeling that I, I feel like I can imagine. Um, We've had the Olympics being postponed this year uh, due to COVID-19. Um, Tape, Patria, I'll start with Tape and then pass to you, uh, Patria, if you don't mind. How would you have reacted if you were meant to compete this year um, and then you found out that the Olympics were going to be postponed? Yeah, I think I would have been dis disappointed, but really devastated. You know, I'm, I'm part of a, a team sport because I enjoy the team environment. I enjoy the, the, the working in teams and traveling with teams. And to have all that hard work negated overnight, literally, um, would be very difficult to take. Patria? Yeah, look, I think very similar for me. Um, you know, the preparation that athletes put into getting ready for a games um, can be many, many years and have, have that dream. Um, well, thankfully, at least they weren't cancelled. They were postponed. Um, so the finish line moved, moved a little bit for them um, and another year of, of hard training to, to get to the starting line. But, um, you know, we're very hopeful that the games will go ahead um, and that the dreams of, of our athletes aren't shattered um, mm. by missing out on, on, on the Olympics and the Paralympics. Would you have any particular advice on staying motivated for that sort of extra 12 months? Oh, I think, um, you know, there's a, you know, it's a common saying within sport that, you know, you can only control the what, things you can't control, you shouldn't worry about. And unfortunately, this is something that's completely out of the control of our athletes and coaches. Um, you know, we're really at the mercy of, of um, you know, what's happening around the world at the moment. And at the moment, what we do know is the rescheduled games start in, in July. I can't recall the da exact date, but um, that, that's what they're all working towards. And until we know something else, um, that's, that's their goal. And, and they'll, I'm sure they'll all be um, working very hard to get there. Thanks so much. Um, now, I wanted to talk specifically to you about what your path to the Olympics looked like. You're one of three Australian women with the highest Olympic medal tally. Um, were you always aiming for the Olympics or is that something that happened naturally? Uh, look, I grew up in a small country town in northern New South Wales called Mullumbimby. And um, I did a whole lot of different sports when I was younger and, and I really enjoyed the opportunity to, to participate in those wide variety of sports. But swimming was always, uh, you know, a natural ability for me. And uh, it was a coastal area as well. So learning how to swim was just part of what kids did. And then I progressed through the local swimming clubs, um, you know, the school competitions and, and things. And I suppose I got to a stage where it was obvious that I had some talent, um, but, you know, there's plenty of talented kids that, that don't get anywhere. Um, mm. And, you know, I, I would needed to move environments to uh, make sure I was able to reach my potential. And, you know, being a small country town, um, the, the facilities shut six months of the year and, um, so I had to relocate um, and I ended up at the Australian Institute of Sport in Canberra to, to pursue my swimming and, um, you know, it was a very tough decision, but looking back on it, probably one of the best decisions I've ever made. Um, Tate, can I ask you, do you remember when you first heard that Australia would be fielding a team for handball in the 2000 Olympics? Yeah, there was speculations as soon as the announcement was made that Sydney had won the Games, but Confirmation came um, a few months into it. I was playing for a local team in Bankstown and I received a call from the national team coach that they would be setting up uh, a talent program. And like Patria, I wasn't talented, but I had to work really hard to get where I, where, I, where I was. So I received the call and without hesitation, I showed up to the first training session. And um, from then on, I decided this was something that I was going to take very seriously and I was going to dedicate a lot of time to it. So, to follow up on that, um, why handball and how did you get into handball, it not being a particularly well-known sport here in Australia? Yeah, so I was born in Australia, but my parents decided to move back to Kosovo or Yugoslavia back then. And one day as part of my punishment in school, I had to mark the handball courts. And they were earth, so I had to, um, I, I, I did that for my punishment. And the other thing I had to do is use a canister to water, to, to water the field, uh, to help the dust settle and not rise. And during that event, I, I became fascinated with the sport. It was a powerful sport, 
very fast, explosive, and I thought this is something that I really wanted to be part of, and I fell in love with the game there. And, and when I returned to Australia as a 16-year-old, as a it was the first thing I was look, looked for is a handball club. From detention to national representation, <laughs> that's a, a very unusual story of um, sporting representation, I, I would guess. Um, this one is for everybody, um, and I, I'll start with Lena, I think. Sure. Um, do you have a favourite memory of the 2000 Olympics? Oh, sure. Well, unlike Patria and Tate, I wasn't an athlete, not that you would guess, but um, so I was living in Sydney at the time, and I have to admit, initially, I was a little nonplussed about the Olympics, I think. I thought, I quite like Sydney at the moment. I don't want hordes of people invading my very lovely city. But then as soon as things kicked off, it was just such a sensational environment to be in. And the city itself, Sydney, just shone as well as the Australian athletes performing. And, you know, watching events on the big screen in the domain and things like that was just absolutely fantastic. And I think, you know, it's something that most people in Sydney at the time would remember really, really fondly. Uh Patria, what about you? Do you have a particular memory of the 2000 Olympics that stands out? Yeah, look, absolutely. Um, unfortunately, I, I wasn't able to go to the opening ceremony. I had to watch that on TV. But when I were, walked out for my first event and into the aquatic centre, um, I just remember getting goosebumps, um, looking up at the stands. I mean, the, the stands were so tall on one side of the pool that you really couldn't see the people at the top properly. <laughs> So to walk in and hear the roar of, I think the capacity was like 15,000 people or something like that, and, and to experience that was, yeah, it gave me goosebumps and something that I'll never forget. And Tate, what was your standout memory from the 2000 Olympics? Two months leading on to the Olympic Games, I was invited to a school in Western Sydney to do a presentation for that school about handball. And when I showed up, a lot of the children in that primary school had brought tennis balls with them thinking that it was that schoolyard handball that they played. So I quickly learned that they had no idea what handball was, so I did a presentation for them. And we engaged really well. After the, after the presentation, they, they, the, the children stayed back and we had a lot of discussion about the games. So when the Olympic Games came around, we were receiving hero faxes. And I noticed that swimming and athletics were receiving a lot of those. And Patria would probably be, um, confirm that. And we weren't receiving many because we were an anonymous sport. And one day, almost overnight, I received about a hundred of those and it all came from this particular school and it made me quite emotional and, and I, I became aware of that connection between the games and the community and how important it was for the community. So I, I was really thankful of those um, and I still have some of them. You were telling me about one that had the tennis ball crossed out. Yeah, so um, one of the children had sent in a, a painting that he'd done and he'd drawn a, a tennis ball and a handball and and the question was, which is the best handball? And he'd crossed out the, the mini tennis ball and it's a tick on the, the handball. So that, yeah, made me quite Clearly, happy. you made an impression. Um, Patria, can I ask, how different was it competing at the 2000 Olympics in Australia compared to competing overseas? Yeah, it's quite a different experience, actually. Um, obviously, it's it's wonderful to be able to experience the home games and uh, myself being a New South Wales girl as well, I'd actually swum in that um, pool at Homebush many times before. Um, so it, it was great to, to compete in that home games, but it was all quite familiar for me as well because I had competed there so many times before and, you know, I've been to Sydney many times before and uh, things. So. It was great to have the home crowd support and be in the home country environment, um, but it also had that familiar, familiarity about it. Um, and I, I, got, I get quite excited when I get to travel and, and you know, see a different country and different city and, and things like that. So it was quite a different experience. And being a home games, there's obviously um, quite a deal of pressure from um, the people of Australia and the media and, and all those types of things as well. And, and, it's, and it's really amplified when you're at a home games because of the attention that's on the event. And look, but, you know, it was a great games. I mean, I think Sydney still goes down as, uh, you know, probably the best games ever. Um, there's probably get arguments from places like <laughs> London, but, um, but, you know, Sydney, Sydney was a wonderful games and it, it highlighted a lot of beautiful country we have in Australia. Um, and also what a beautiful city Sydney is as well. Absolutely. 
Uh, so I'm going to come across to Tate now. Uh, when we were having discussions early on in the development of this program, you mentioned to me that the men's handball team for the Sydney Olympic Games was officially the most multicultural team that was fielded at the Sydney Olympic Games. How do you go about bringing a team that diverse together? That's right. The inside joke in the team was uh, leading into the games that we need to start speaking English and learn the national anthem. We had something like 17 languages represented, 13 nationalities, 16 of the 21 members were born overseas. And it was quite a challenge. We had a lot of different cultures and our coach was from Hungary as well. But what helped was that we we spent a lot of time traveling overseas to the Middle East, Europe, um, Japan, and we started learning about other cultures, about one another. And when you spend so much time together, you get to know a lot about one another and you get to know a lot about the cultures. But the one uniting factor was that we were representing Australia and this was something that brought a lot of pride to all of us and it helped bring in everything together. It must have been quite a special experience. Uh, Lena, can I, changing tack a bit, uh, why, as a social history museum, as we are at the National Museum, why do we collect around the Olympics? That's a really great question, Penny. And I mean, not everyone loves their sport, but I think in Australian culture and history, sport plays this really interesting role, not only in sort of in a domestic sphere, but also on the international stage. And the Olympics are those key events where Australia is really putting itself out there when our athletes travel, representing Australia as well, but also with the home games, as Patria mentioned, that kind of pressure on Sydney itself to perform in 2000. And it was the same for 1956 in Melbourne, which was the first time that the Olympics had been held outside of Europe or North America. So I think collecting around the Olympics is really important on a lot of different levels to celebrate the achievements of the athletes, but also to look at how Australians kind of saw themselves and presented themselves on a world stage at particular points in time. And following on from that, what other Olympic collections does the museum have? Uh, so as you would have seen in the preview, at the moment we've got objects on display from both the Sydney 2000 and the Melbourne 1956 Olympics. However, the museum does have a wider range of Olympic material. And I'll just mention a couple of my favourites. So one of them is, relates to John Conrads, who Patria, I'm sure you'd be well familiar with as a swimmer, who was actually part of the 1956 swimming team, but didn't compete. But then in 1960 in Rome, he actually just blew everyone out of the water. And what I love about this story is that Conrads was an immigrant to Australia uh, in the 1950s. And so there's this really interesting nexus between immigration and sport, becoming an Australian, representing Australia, all that kind of thing. And then another one of the great collections that we have jumps forward to the London 2012 Paralympic Games. And we've got some material relating to Sue Powell, who was a cyclist and won Australia's first medal at those games. So that's just a little bit of an example of the range of Olympic material that the National Museum has. And it's something that I'm always keeping my eye out for as well. All right. Uh, so following on from this idea of collecting, uh, Patria, I'm going to throw this to you at least to start with. What objects have you held on to from the 2000 Olympics? Um, I've got pretty much everything, I think. Um, all my uniform, although it doesn't quite fit anymore. But, um, you know, I have, um, I have my Olympic medal, which I can show you. So that's a bronze medal. I do have a couple of silvers from Sydney as well, but they were very tarnished, so I didn't <laughs> think they were appropriate to show today. Um, so, and I've got one of the really special things I was involved in was the, the torch relay. So I've got a um, Sydney Olympic um, torch there that was, um, you know, provided great memories for me as well. But look, it, it's the sort of thing, you know, when you're involved in something like the Olympics, it's, you don't really want to throw stuff away, um, even though I, would rarely get anything out, put any items of my uniform out and wear it. Although I have found a 
ate one of our jumpers that we had for Sydney 2000 and put that on for today. Um, but it's the sort of stuff that you don't throw away. Um, you work too hard to earn it. And mm. it's something that you can treasure and, and show, you know, your kids and your grandkids kids into the future. And Tate, what sort of objects did you hang on to from the 2000 Olympics? Yeah, I'm like Patricia, I gave a lot of my stuff out to friends and family. And, but, and, but I did keep the opening ceremony suit, which I love. I love the colours. It represents Australia. And I kept my uh, two jerseys, uh, one green and one gold, yeah. which I probably need some advice on, on, from the curators on how to <laughs> keep them because I can, I've noticed that they're starting to wear out of it. Have to get the conservators on side to figure out how to best display them. <laughs> Uh, Lena, now moving into some of the collections that we have here at the museum, um, what was it like putting Betty, our Cupid doll, on display again? Well, Betty, um, as I mentioned, was part of the closing ceremony at the Sydney 2000 Olympics, and we were really keen to get her on display for the 20th anniversary of those Olympics. And fortunately, we have a giant space here in the Gandil Atrium at the museum to be able to do that because she's over six metres tall. And so it was a really fantastic team effort from museum conservation team, registrars. So we worked with large technology because it's a very big object, but also with our textile conservators to make sure that that skirt was looking absolutely amazing. And when I say team effort, I mean about 12 people actually getting that Cupy doll together, and as you saw in the pre-record, lifting that giant torso to fit onto the skirt, people under the skirt putting the hoops in like a crinoline and that kind of thing, and making sure that the arms were raised in that celebratory gesture as well. So it was super fun um, and really probably one of the most unique things I've got to do working here at the museum. All right, uh, we're starting to get some audience questions coming in, which is really lovely. I think our first question is for Tate and Patria. So I'll ask it and then I'll throw to Patria and then Tate. Uh, how do you prepare right before competing to deal with the adrenaline and the nerves before entering the court or the pool? So that's from Kerry on YouTube. Patria? Yeah. Look, it's, um, it's a very individual thing, pre preparing for a major event, and um, everyone does it probably slightly differently. And um, my um, the things I like to do, I was a bit ritualistic, I suppose, and I had a set routine that I like to follow. And um, that really involved, obviously, warming up and, and getting changed into my uh, competition swimsuit. And, and then I'd um, usually try and find um, someone in the team management to um, take my rings off and my earrings off and they used to mine them for me so that they didn't go missing and that was that was all part of it and um, you know then in the marshalling area you know immediately before going out onto pool deck I really just tried to stay relaxed and, and talking to people um, I, I didn't like sort of being too insular and getting too serious about it all but obviously once I stepped down onto that pool deck and uh, that was the game face was on and I knew what I was there to do and, and um, most of the time how to do it. <laughs> Tate, did you have a similar ritual approach or did you approach it quite differently? Yeah, like Patria said, it's an individual thing that uh, athletes have. I personally would watch a lot of video about the opponent, try and understand how they play and try and put myself into the game. So visualising was very important. In the minutes before the game, I would tie my shoelaces way too hard, way too many times <laughs> and when the nerves start really kicking in. And talking to my teammates, um, visualising the game and trying to bring yourself, your energy up during the warm-up was, was a major part of the routine, yes. Patria, I've got another one coming in from you. This one's from, for you, sorry, not from you. This one's from Maggie and she would like to know, could you hear the crowds roaring as you swam? Yeah, generally at the big events, yes, you can. Um, you know, your head does go underwater, but, you know, for me, I was a butterfly swimmer, so my head, you know, came, came up and down out of the water and you can't necessarily hear the specifics, but you can hear the noise. Um, and you know that, you know, if you know, when you're getting towards the, the end of the race, that if it's noisy, 
uh, particularly at a home games, um, that you're in a pretty good position as well. So, um, yeah, you can definitely hear it and it does uh, definitely does spur you on. It's fantastic. We have a question from Colin and this one's for Lena. Lena, does the museum have anything on Cathy Freeman? Oh, Colin, oh, to have things of Cathy Freeman's, to be honest. Uh, the museum actually doesn't have much on Cathy Freeman at all. And when I was putting this display together, it was something that I kept wishing for, to be honest. The Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences up in Sydney uh, has the torch that Cathy Freeman used to light the cauldron at the opening ceremony. And also in terms of the um, the bodysuit she was wearing for that opening ceremony too. There's a great story around that, about it having gone missing and about it recently turning up as well at the um, museum down in Melbourne, the sports museum there. So there are some museum connections, but unfortunately we don't have a lot. We've got a jersey that was signed by Cathy Freeman for a charity auction, but in terms of her sort of Olympic material relating to Sydney 2000, we don't have much, but if you know of anything, let me know. Uh, that's uh, curator at nma.gov.au. <laughs> uh, Colin also would love to comment that he remembers you, Patria, as a fine ambassador for Australian sport. <laughs> We're Thank you. coming towards, oh, sorry, Patria. Um, we are coming towards the end of our program, unfortunately. We do have time for a couple of questions, so please do keep putting them through. If we don't get to them, we will respond in the text below. So uh, keep, keep them in the public comments rather than on the live stream so that we can get back to them. Sam would like to make the comment that Tate is a great futsal <laughs> player too. Uh, is Sam a plant, Tate? <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. Uh, so, what's, what is the most rewarding part of the Olympic experience, do you think, um, as an athlete? And I'm going to pass that first to you, Patria. Yeah, well, the Olympics um, is, is quite a special event, I think. It's, you know, the athletes of the world come together um, in peace and it's just a wonderful environment when you can walk around a, an Olympic precinct and, and it's not only athletes, but people come from all over the world to go to an Olympics. And um, it's a really special environment to be in where everyone comes together in that peaceful way and um, is there just to celebrate, um, you know, the, the best parts of humanity, I suppose, really. And, and the Olympics is not just about the sport, it's a celebration of culture as well, of, of the country that you're in. and. Um, it, it really does have a special feeling about it. Um, for those who, do, who have been in an Olympic city, um, it, 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 it is special. Yeah. Um, Tate, what about you? Do you have a particular thing that stands out as being the most special about being an athlete at an Olympic Games? As a team athlete, I would say the friendships you make along the way and, and the bonds that you create with, with the players that you've been in part of this journey. They stay with you for, for the rest of your life. To this day, I have really strong connection with my teammates. We, have, we meet from time to time and reminisce about the past. Um, and Lena, as a spectator, do you think there's anything that particularly stands out to you? Oh, gosh. Well, the two weeks in Sydney definitely converted me from a, I don't want the Olympics in Sydney to going, this is the best thing that has ever happened to the city. Um, and I think, as Patria said, that, that sense of just people from all over the world coming together every four years to celebrate the best things um, about, you know, about us really, I think is something that the Olympics crystallises and it's an amazing thing to be part of as a, as a spectator as well. It's, um, it's an incredible community that the Olympics builds. I remember the 2000 Olympics was the first time I was allowed to travel to Sydney by myself. And I got my first mobile phone so that when we were going to see the equestrian events, uh, I could easily be tracked. <laughs> but, um, and that was a very special experience to be trusted to be a grown up for the first time. Yeah. Uh, so thank you everybody for joining us, whether you've joined us on the Facebook live stream or through YouTube.
The Olympic objects are on display until the 20th of December, I believe, or till mid-December. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. And if you're watching on Facebook Live, don't forget to turn on live notifications so that you don't miss us out in future. Our next live at the museum is not on a Thursday. It is on Friday the 27th of November at the special time of 12 p.m. It will be with author and broadcaster Benjamin Law and our curator Craig Middleton talking about the pandemic and launching Momentus, which is our online collecting project around the pandemic and the bushfires. Uh, also coming up on the 14th of November, we have the Gold Plus Curiosity Lecture with Kevin McLeod. He is in conversation with John Wardle, who is the 2020 AIA Gold Medal winner. That will be streamed live from the UK and from Melbourne, respectively. And they'll be joined here in the Gandel Atrium by our Swain Design Fellow, Adrian Erickson. So that's Saturday, the 14th of November. For more information, please do check out the NMA website, nma.gov.au. And we will see you again, hopefully, on the 14th and the 27th of November. Thank you very much for joining us. Good afternoon.